Hi, everyone. Michelle Ann Collins here with my friend and colleague, Melissa I'm not, Uchida. Uchida. I want to make sure I pronounce it correctly. Um, we have decided to make a few videos to help widows or people who are supporting widows or people who have lost someone to suicide because both of us have lost a spouse to suicide. And we thought that telling our stories and helping sh sharing the things that we've learned over the course of our journey to a healing place, <laughs> the journey doesn't actually end, but we met in David Kessler's Grief Educator Certification Program. So both of us are very... Uh, proactive about learning about grief and how to support people in grief. And we thought coming together, having a conversation would be helpful to more than just the two of us. Yeah, it's been um, quite a journey. And if you were watching this, if you know someone that has had um, the loss that we're talking about, a death by suicide and um and first, we're, we're so sorry, you know, it's, it's a uh, grief is hard enough anyway, and to add something like suicide, it's, um, it's a topic that people are not comfortable talking about. And it's something that's becoming more prevalent. And it's something that we feel really strongly um, is preventable to some degree. Um, but really, it's about exposing, um, you know, Brene Brown said this beautiful thing that shame can only live under a rock. And so when you turn the light on, when you expose it, it, it there's no shame. And it really is about providing support for the, the survivors of, of someone, a loved one who's died by suicide. And that's what we're here to do. So yeah, education is so important. And we're actually Recording this in 2023 during what is known uh, as Suicide Awareness Month during September. There's also Global Suicide Awareness Day, Suicide Prevention Week, all of these things depending on which organization you tune into. But basically the bottom line is just talking about it, being aware of it, making people more aware of uh, the act of suicide as something that is an extension of a mental disease, mental discomfort, emotional difficulty. Um, it may have been sudden. You may have had no idea that the suicide was coming or the person that you're mourning may have planned it for months or years or even had previous attempts. But that awareness can help us take the stigma out of suicide. We're shifting in the in the grief and suicide loss community from the use of the word committed suicide to the use of the word died by suicide. Just for one example of the many things that the suicide loss and grief world are trying to do to take the stigma out of it, be able to say the word, be able to communicate your feelings, Oftentimes, uh, this, in the suicide prevention world, they talk about just talking about it helps disempower it. So if you ever have thoughts of self-harm, please get help right away. Tell someone right away and don't feel shame. It's very common. It's much more common than we know or talk about. And that's how we help heal the world from suicide loss. I think that's so important to say that the suicidal ideation, the idea of, and, and it, there can be s such different degrees to it of the thought of, I don't want to be alive, or, or the thought of, I just want the pain to stop, or the thought of, I don't want to have to face this really big problem or this really, what you we see is this really big, heavy um, something, we don't want to face it. So you know, they, they call that suicidal ideation. And um, 
And that just talking about it and saying, yeah, you know what, there are some days I really just don't want to get out of bed and that that's okay. It doesn't mean that a person is going to take any action. Um, and uh, often talking about it, it is a way of putting it out there so that it diffuses before you get to the taking action stage. And um, thanks, Michelle, for saying too, it really, it's a, it's a, suicide is a product of mental illness. I firmly believe that. Um, I'll just tell my story kind of briefly. My husband, Nate, um, died by suicide when he was 40. And um, he was, he was mentally ill. Um, and it was, I, I saw signs from early on in our relationship, but then they kind of muted, they were kind of gone. And then um, about two years before his death, they started really amping up. He would have these rage episodes and we didn't know what they were coming from. I was like, okay, you need anger management. I mean, I just didn't, I said, so I, that's what I told him, go get anger management. That's what you need to do. So he went to go look for anger management workshops and started therapy and, and, and through counseling. And he had two different therapists started through counseling, started talking about abuse that had happened when he was a child and this that started coming out and how he felt about it and the shame and the, um, but these rage episodes and they became psychosis. Uh, they turned, they developed into these psychosis episodes to the point that I didn't call him Nate anymore. I called this, this other persona the Nate that hates Nate. And that was, um, it was like a blackness came over his eyes. Everything about his whole energy changed and it happened like that. And I didn't know what was going to send it off, what was going to activate the Nate that hates Nate to come in. Um, but when he would have these episodes, they would start off as small 10 minutes, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, then toward the end, it started to be hours, you know, all night long, not letting me sleep. And, and really, he, he seemed to really need someone to witness his pain. Um, and so he had made threats. I, it wasn't, it, it, it's, you know, it's so weird because you, even when people make threats and say things, you don't, you're still never, it's not like you're prepared. It's not like, I remember the police showing up at the house and my thinking, and they said, oh, we we found him. And my first reaction was, oh, thank God. Not even, even though they had me sit down, the officer asked me to sit down in the front of the police car, which was an indication, right? I mean, that doesn't happen very often. Um, and it was, but that, that just feeling of, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. You just said you found him. Not make, and you and I, I definitely was in shock. I would, I would say for a couple of months. Um, I don't remember very much about the first year and the it's the body's way of protecting itself. Um, it's there's so much there. I do remember things like hunting around looking for clues, looking for signs, looking for the little things he would have left. What, how did this happen? When was he, uh, you know, um, and reading through journals and, and taking a long time to go through my process of finding out what had happened and, and then starting the process of healing, which is when it comes to death of a spouse is it's um it's like losing they say you know two you're not supposed to get together with someone when it's two halves made a whole but Nate and I were definitely felt whole, wholer when we were together and I definitely felt completely shattered without him and um and so starting the process and thank God for David Kessler too who mm. um, you know I really I don't I don't even know where I would be without without tender hearts in that community and with him so um, hmm. Let's take a breath here and just pause and remember Nate and just give ourselves and our audience a, just a moment to absorb what all of the feelings that come with your story. It's such a big story. You've been through so much and you're so resilient and I, I just want to 
name that and, and let you know that it's being witnessed. Thank you. <sighs> Big stuff. And it's hard to talk about, but that's our drive here to be making these recordings. Um, so Glenn was my second husband and we um, met a, a year after we had both been divorced and fell madly in love. And I mean, he asked me to marry him for the first time a week after we met. And it was, it was like falling into a black hole. I mean, neither one of us wanted to be away from each other for five minutes. And uh, it was just so intense and it wasn't healthy. And I didn't see that at the time because when you're in an unhealthy relationship or a situation, a lot of times you don't have that awareness. And you know, a lot of my loved ones recognized right away that it wasn't a healthy relationship and distanced themselves from me, which made everything harder uh, to feel unsupported. Um, and after we were together, just shy of two years is when he ended his life. He had also started to rage. He had also started to, uh, he did threaten, threaten me to harm me and um, I actually, we were living separately when he died. I had asked him to move out because I had become frightened of him and his uh, behavior. So five weeks after he moved out and we were still in touch, we were talking almost every day and um, he would show up all the time. We shared a dog. So he would, he would take our dog happy on adventures <laughs> and, um, one day I got a call from a friend of his who he'd been spending a lot of time with um, while we were separated. And she wanted me to go check on him because she couldn't get a hold of him. And he had rented an apartment just at the bottom of my street. So it wasn't very far. And I went down there and she had called the police. The police were there uh, and they were hesitating to enter the apartment because they knew he was armed and obviously distraught. I met them in the parking lot and they told me to wait by the car while they entered the apartment. And it was at that point that I discovered his body in the car, in the parking lot. So I was alone uh, for, for a brief moment. And then um, I went and got the police to come back. And basically they had to reconfirm what I had seen because the trauma of seeing what I saw sent me into shock. Like Melissa had mentioned, you, you, it's very traumatic and very easy to go into shock. And I was probably in shock for months as well. And after about three months, I developed PTSD. So I started having flashbacks and uh, dissociation episodes where I wasn't where my body was, like my consciousness was back at the scene where I discovered his body or back at the scene of a uh, fight we had had or something like that. And so I sought trauma therapy. I did not find David Kessler or Tender Hearts right away. I wish I had because I, I felt very isolated in my grief. I felt like no one had ever gone through what I had, what I was going through. And it's so important to find not only a therapist, but a group of people that can support you. Uh, Melissa and I can support you, but uh, grief.com has an incredible, deep community for not just suicide loss, any type of loss. And it's absolutely wonderful. David Kessler at the helm of that. So after I went through trauma therapy for years, probably two or three years, I came out the other side, having gone through so much healing and so much learning about, you know, primarily somatic therapy, which I already knew a lot about from being a yoga therapist. There's some similarities that I already learned and learning about meditation and mindfulness and just gathering so many tools um, and then a couple years later, just this, this last January, I was able to release two books about suicide loss of a spouse or partner and then how to support a, a suicide loss survivor. Uh, and, and it's still healing. I'm still healing. Writing those books was healing. 
And uh, Melissa and I in a future video are going to share some of our deepest tools, our most useful tools and experiences that helped us get to the point where we can be here trying to help you. Yeah, we really um, thank you, Michelle, for sharing your story um, and for sharing a bit about Glenn with us too. And, you know, if, as people, um, when as people make their way through grief and and trying to break apart, I compare it to like getting a necklace really knotted up or a couple of necklaces, you know, when you get them so knotted and you just, if we were to yank on them and try to pull them apart that way, it just gets tighter and there's resistance. So it's almost like as we work through suicide loss and, and, and whether it's a, a spouse or someone else, but slowly starting to create some space, you know, get the needle or the tweezers out and you're slowly starting to peel apart the parts of the knot just so there's enough space that you can actually see different aspects and start to um, pull them apart. And it is one of, there is, it is one of the things with grief work that can be so beautiful in a way is that we go through this terrible pain, this unthinkable pain, and through that pain, we're able to start to make meaning and find meaning and to be able to help others because of our pain. Yeah, Melissa, I love that um, image of the tight, right? Because if you just, if you, grieving is hard, it hurts, and, and it's challenging in every way. And, but if you just decide one day, I'm not going to grieve anymore, it, it doesn't go away. You can't just pull that necklace out of its knot. That would be lovely. You could just take a pill or go on a vacation yeah. and have it be all gone, but each little you have to be gentle with your grief. You have to tease out. And what I found, and I don't know, Melissa, if you had this experience or not, but what I found was going through my trauma therapy, all of my trauma came out. So I had the trauma of losing Glenn and all of my estranged relationships and, and tangled mess of my life in general after that period, but all the way back to my childhood trauma I had never, ever discussed with any therapist, any friend, anyone. And I went on a journey to, to try to heal that. And so it was, if possible, bigger than losing my spouse to suicide. It was figuring out my whole life. <laughs> and it took a lot of delicate lot of a lot of delicate peeling and and for anyone that's on this journey along with us i would say the one of the most important um foundations and it might not even seem possible right now but is self-compassion it is almost giving yourself a big hug and you're not hugging even just the person that you are today, someone who's lost someone to suicide or lost someone at all. You're hugging the child from however many decades ago that didn't have what they needed and what they deserved and what they needed to grow. And so, um, and really having compassion there, you know, normally I, I would be so quick to criticize myself. This is before Nate's death. I compare life now. There's before Nate's death and there's after Nate's death. I mean, it is like, right? It's that, that's how I can differentiate yeah. time. Um, and before Nate's death, I would be really critical and really judgmental of myself and of others. And um, after Nate's death, there is that is something I... I, I work on every day. Am I giving myself compassion? And have I um, th then been able to be compassionate to those around me, knowing that everyone, everyone is suffering in some way, everyone has their stuff. We just don't know what it is. Um, right. Because most people don't talk about it. So right. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. That's always my number one as well. Muli says, give yourself a break. Whatever it, you treat yourself as your best friend would treat you if it's a good best friend <laughs> somebody who has your heart who has your best interest in mind who really loves you unconditionally try to be that person for yourself 
and everything else in your life can grow better out of that self-acceptance, self-compassion. And in future videos, uh, Melissa and I are going to give you all tips how to get there, how to just put one foot in front of the other. We're going to share our tools with you and mm, love and blessings. And thank you so much for watching our video today and or listening to it and for being brave enough to take a step toward healing. Thank you for being here and uh, we hope to see you soon.